everyone. Thank you for joining us in house and online. Let's stand and sing Love Lifted Me. Where did love lift you from? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair. message from the Lord. Hallelujah. Message unto you I'll give. Look and live. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look in 
is only that you look and live. Uh, verse 2 talks about the message the world needs today. I have a message full of love. Hallelujah. A message, oh my friend, for you. Tis a message from above. Hallelujah. Jesus said it, and I know tis true. People need Jesus today. We're divided, and the only way we can be brought back together is through Jesus Christ. Let's pray for our offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm just rejoicing that we can be in your house this morning. Uh, I pray that we'll always be grateful that our uh, doors are open and we can come worship freely. And I pray that you'll uh, bring unity into our hearts today, into our homes, into our church. And I pray especially bring unity to our nation. Help us Christians and us uh, Bible-believing churches to go out and preach the gospel and uh, bring that great unifying love through uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And I pray that people will be saved and uh, people will know that they're going to heaven one day. And I pray that you'll bless this offering we're about to receive. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. the dump the dump part at the end so let's stand and sing nothing between my soul and the savior not of this world's delusive dream nothing between my soul and the savior not of this world's delusive dream Cause 
And before Holly and Carrie comes to sing this morning, let's sing two verses of He Keeps Me Singing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace, be still. In all of the ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing. Keeps me singing as I go. On that last verse, soon he's coming back. Soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry sky. Before we start, um, I was thinking of this song that we're singing, and we have all gone through hard times, um, especially, you know, the past year and this year, and our faith has been tested and shaken. Um, but in Naaman 1, 7, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And throughout all these difficulties that we are facing, um, I personally am thankful that in 2020 we were able to see my grandpa come to know the Lord Amen. and my nephew. Um, and both we've been praying for a very long time. So I just want to encourage you that even though we're going through uncharted waters and our faith is tested, that we can say throughout it all that God's been good. <laughs> I've been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. No other way to tell you but to say. The best way I can say it 
That's a good song, isn't it? All right, if you have your Bible today, would you please stand and turn to the book of Acts today? Thank you for coming to church today. Enjoy that beautiful song today. Acts chapter 9 today. Acts chapter 9 today. I'm spending some time on Sunday morning here in the book of Acts and hope that uh, it's a blessing to an encouragement to you. Last week, we preached a message on a divine appointment, the appointment with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and the conversion of that man to Christ and how he became the first missionary kind of to Ethiopia and changed that nation for Christ. So we're grateful for that. So Acts chapter 9 today and verses 1 through 9. Today's message is on the conversion of a man named Saul. The conversion of a man named Saul. And I liked it this morning. I think there was a kid in here who said, Amen, this morning. I thought I heard that. Is that right? Yeah. I said, well, you need to teach him young. There you go. I like that. Very, very good. And uh, amen just simply means so be it. So we're grateful for that. So Acts chapter 9, and I got a kick out of that this morning. I thought I heard a, a little one say amen. So that's good. Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Now, the phrase, this way, is really a reference to those who had put their faith and trust in Christ with what we would call Christians. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I think that's interesting that he didn't really believe in the Lord, but realized that this was the Lord speaking to him. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And verse number 7 is interesting. I've read this many, many times, and I never saw it until I studied it the other day. And, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So they heard the voice, but they didn't see anybody. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he, was the, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Aren't you glad today if you're saved, you're saved? Amen. And you can all think of your conversion experience, and this is a very familiar portion of Scripture, having to deal with Saul's conversion, who then later became the great Apostle Paul, the writer of many, many books in the New Testament, and really grateful for his life. So what a great account this is today about the conversion of a man named Saul. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege to be here today in church. And Lord, we're grateful that we can be here. We're thankful most of all that we've been saved. We've trusted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And I pray, God, that you would speak to hearts today and encourage us in this area of telling people about the Lord and that there's no person beyond the saving grace of God. And Lord, we're thankful that this man Saul got saved and how it changed his life and what a great impact he had in that day and is still having today on people thousands of years later. And God, what a testimony to the grace of God and the working in a man's heart by the name of Saul. So Lord, help us to see some wonderful truths from this passage of Scripture today. 
and help us be ever grateful if we're saved today. And if there's someone listening who does not know Christ, may today be they, the day that they would receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So thank you again today for your goodness to us and the blessing we can be in church today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus, the leading persecutor of the Christians at that particular time, was perhaps the greatest event in all of church history except for the coming of the Holy Spirit of God at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The conversion of this man Saul was a marvelous event that took place and what great impact it had on the world in that day and is still having an impact on us even today as we read the letters of the great apostle Paul and the great teaching as he instructed uh, many believers and many uh, Christians and was responsible for the salvation of countless people who came to Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ is in the business of changing lives and changing people. And maybe you can give a testimony today of that fact that when you got saved, how God changed your life. No matter how hard or hateful or hypocritical or horrifying or haughty a person is, God can save the soul of that individual. He can forgive and cleanse any person of sin and give him or her a new life in Jesus Christ. For example, author Elgin Moore, he told the story of Mel Trotter. Now, Mel Trotter, many of you may have heard of Mel Trotter, but Mel Trotter was a barber by profession and a drunkard by perversion. He was a barber by profession and a drunkard by perversion. He had sunk so deep into debauchery and sin and drunkenness that when his young daughter died, he actually stole the shoes she was to be buried in out of the casket and sold them so he could get some more liquor. Alcohol will really control a person's life. Boy, you see it all the time. When I go to the store, and grocery store, everybody has, almost everybody has it in their carts and coming out the door and everything else. And I seen a person not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, me and my wife was in a car and uh, going through a drive-in, picking up a prescription, and we was close to a liquor store. And there was an old man kind of come out, and he could hardly, hardly walk. And he had a case of beer. And he got to the car, and he was leaning up against the car, to try to open the door, he lost his balance. And he fell backward without any breaking of his fall and smacked his head on the asphalt. And I was just watching to see what was going to happen. So somebody got out of the car. Is a woman. I don't, I don't know if they were married. I don't know if she was an old woman. Maybe they were. I don't know. But she got out of the car, came around, and picked up the alcohol and put that in the car. And left the guy on the ground. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And some people came. I mean, I don't know if the guy had a concussion. I mean, he hit his skull. Just It's like falling back without breaking and boom on the asphalt, like it knocked him out. But there was a man who really didn't need alcohol and what it's probably done to his life and maybe their family and the destruction that that plays. But Mel Trotter was certainly a drunkard and an alcoholic. And the thing that he did with his, his baby daughter, how horrible that would be. But one night in Chicago, he was extremely drunk, and he staggered into the Pacific Garden Mission there in Chicago. That night, he was marvelously saved by the grace of God. He grew in the Lord and became so burdened for men, for men who were on Skid Row that he opened a rescue mission in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He went on to start more than 60 more missions, and became the supervisor of a chain of them stretching from Boston all the way to San Francisco. Christ transformed him and his purpose in life. In this chapter, the Lord confronted the chiefest of all sinners, according to Saul's own words in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1 and verse 15. He was the bitterest, he was the boldest, he was the baddest, he was the most bloodthirsty enemy of Christianity at that time. There are enemies in America of Christianity today. And we're starting to hear them as they raise their ugly heads in defiance of God and trying to put down the church and the cause of Christ and Christianity. 
But no person is ever going to put down the cause of Christ, because upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so as much as people have tried throughout history to get rid of the Bible and get rid of Christianity, God always has a people. And aren't you grateful for that? You see, God saved this man and used him to spread the gospel across the globe and write 13 books of the New Testament, which are a comfort and a challenge to us even today. With the conversion of this man, God demonstrated his love for all and his power to save anyone who is willing to be saved. No one is beyond the saving grace of God. And aren't you grateful for that? No one is too wicked. No one is too evil. No one cannot be saved if they're willing to be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what a great truth that is. The name of this man is Saul. And he was on the Damascus road. And he came to a fork in the road in his life. In 1 Timothy, I'm going to read this. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 15, he alludes to this about being the chiefest of sinners. And the Bible says here in verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And that's uh, 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 the Apostle Paul, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Now, anybody know what the word injurious means? We don't use that word in our culture today, but it has significant meaning, and that word is prevalent even in our culture today. And the word means a bully. How many have ever been bullied? Anybody? We see it all the time. We see about it, and kids go to school, and they're bullied. People are bullied in the workplace. People are bullied in society. So Saul was a bully, and he was a mean man. He was a wicked man, and he was a bully, and he was a violent aggressor. That's what that word means. It means not only being a bully, but he violently and was aggressive in his bullying and his persecution and his killing of Christians. He was a wicked man. Nobody wanted to be around this man because he was a wicked man. And then it says in verse 30, But I obtained mercy. Aren't you glad for mercy? Because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Nobody's beyond the saving grace of God. And so we're grateful for that. And even if you know someone, maybe you know a boy. No, maybe you know someone who is aggressively violent. That person needs Christ. This world needs Christ. America needs Christ. Our communities need a relationship with Jesus Christ. It would solve a lot of the problems in our world and in our cities and in our culture if we could get a number of people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ and could transform our communities with the gospel. And the reason we are having so much problem is because we've not been very successful in doing that in America. And now we're reaping the consequences of really a Christless culture, for the most part. And America is not necessarily really a Christian nation anymore as such. It's really a more of a... Uh, uh, really caught up in materialism and things like that and almost anti-God at almost every step of the way. And so we're living almost in a post-Christian America Amen. for the most part, if we really were to boil that down. And so the things that we're ha seeing happen in our streets, in our cities, is a result of people saying, I do not want God in my life and I want God out of my life. And along the way, uh, we have kind of put that into practice, trying to take God out of our schools, take God out of this, take God out of everything. And we're reaping what's happening in a culture that really has removed God. Amen. And so as Christians, we don't have anybody to blame except ourselves in that we need to be reaching a lot more people for Christ and talking to people about the Lord. It's one thing to sing about in church, one thing to say amen. It's another thing to go out the door and actually open your mouth and talk to people about the Lord. And that's really what we need to do. And so we see here several things in Acts chapter 9 about this man named Saul. 
Saul, in verses 1 and 2, was ruthless as well as fanatical. Now, I want you to listen to that. And I said that slowly because I want us to understand we're living in a world today that calls Christians fanatics. Aren't we? And we need to be fanatical about Jesus Christ. And here was a man who was a fanatic. And he was fanatical in what he believed. And what he believed was the destruction of people and the destruction of Christians and the destruction of anyone who called upon the name of Christ. And he was a zealot and he was fanatical about that. And so we hear a lot about those words today, but we need to understand some of the other meanings concerning that as we kind of go through this passage of Scripture. And so in verse 1, the Bible says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any one of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound in Jerusalem. He went in and got the authority from those individuals, got the papers in his hand, that he could travel to Damascus and then go into the synagogues. And if anybody was of the way, he could take those people, bound them and bring them back to Jerusalem, probably imprison them or perhaps kill them. And he was fanatical about killing Christians. And there's people in the world today that are fanatical about killing you and killing me, and killing those who call upon the name of Christ. We haven't seen it much in America, but it's been all around the world for a long time. And perhaps it's coming to our shores and our cities, and there are going to be some fanatical people that perhaps will try to do everything they can to shut down the church and shut down the cause of Christ and shut down Christianity. And they'll be fanatical about doing that. Saul not only opposed Christians, he ruthlessly attacked them and he persecuted them with great enthusiasm and great excitement. He was excited and enthusiastic to kill people. He got his thrills from doing this. In Acts chapter 26, the Bible says, if you want to turn there in Acts chapter 26... And verses 10 and 11, the Bible says this about Saul. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, the religious crowd. See, religion doesn't save you. Religion doesn't transform your life. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ transform your life. And so these were religious people, but these religious people gave Saul the paperwork and the authority to do whatever he wanted to do with Christians because many people hated Christians. And the Bible says there, and they gave the authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, now don't mix, miss this next phrase, I gave my voice against them. Saul said, I spoke up in their, not their defense, but I spoke up in their persecution. I wanted them dead. I wanted them to die. And I used my voice to speak up against them. How many think today there's a lot of people speaking up about a lot of things that really aren't right and really aren't correct? And in verse 11 it says, And I punished them oft." in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme and be exceedingly mad against them, I, com- I, per- I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So when he says, I gave my voice, he gave his vote for their destruction and their annihilation and their deaths. Kent Hughes said this, about the passage. Threatening and slaughter had come to be the very breath that Saul breathed. Like a war horse that sniffs out the smell 
of a battle. This man was ruthless as well as fanatical in what he did to believers. They call Christians today fanatics. Christians might be labeled fanatical because of their devotion and their love for Christ. And that's okay to be fanatical in that. You go ahead and be that. We understand that Satan's crowd is always fanatical. And we need to realize this, that we have an enemy that's fanatical, and we have an enemy that wants to silence the church, and wants to silence God, and wants to silence the Christians, and anything to do with the cause of Christ, and to make it very difficult upon us. They have throughout the world, and some of that may be coming even to America in the days ahead in which we live. But you need to understand that Satan's crowd is always fanatical. You remember the prophets of Baal? You remember the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse number 28? And Elijah uh, had some type of a confrontation or uh, uh, some type of a thing. He said, if your God be God, then we'll serve God. If our God be God, then we'll serve Him. And they, remember what they did in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 28. The Bible says, and they cried aloud... And cut themselves. They took knives and cut their flesh and sliced into their flesh. The Bible says the blood was gushing out. I'd say those people were fanatical. And they were fanatical to a person by the name of Baal who could not help them, could not save them, could not do anything for them. It was just a stone idol. But they were fanatical to the point that they were even willing to give their lives and bleed to death. You see, Satan's crowd is always fanatical. And sometimes God's people and God's crowd kind of take a back seat and have a soft voice. And uh, that's not what the Bible teaches us in many passages of scriptures. We're to be soldiers of Jesus Christ. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. It's a gory, gross scene. And finally, Elijah, after they've done all that and done all that, he said, enough, enough. And he prays a 63-word prayer to heaven. And he tells them to douse the altar with buckets and buckets of water. And we won't go into all the meaning of that, but that was a slap in the face to their God. And so he douses the buckets of water and buckets of water. And he prays a 63-word prayer. And the fire of God comes down from heaven and consumes the altar, the water, and burns it all up. And God's God. And many died that day, the false prophets of Baal. Do you remember the Jewish unbelievers and what they did to Jesus? I'm trying to get you to paint a picture today that, you know, they may call us fanatical, but it's okay to be a fanatic and believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a fanatic. I believe in Jesus Christ. But Satan has his fanatics, and his fanatics are always destructive. Remember what those fanatics said when Jesus was about to be crucified? In John chapter 19 and verse 15, they said, But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! When they were given the chance to either release Barabbas or release Christ, and Barabbas was a known criminal and had done criminal activity, and he was guilty and Jesus was innocent, the Son of God, and they said, Away with him! We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. That's a fanatical crowd. That's Satan's crowd, by the way. These same folks stoned Stephen to death. They were kind of fanatics too. They refused to hear the truth. They were pretty fanatical. In Acts chapter 7, verses 57 and 58, the Bible says, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, 
at the instruction of this man Stephen as he preached the word of God. They couldn't stand it any longer. They covered their ears. They screamed out. They cried with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and ran upon him, the Bible says, in one accord and cast him out of the city. They must have taken him and picked him up and carried him out or whatever and got him out of the city and they stoned him. And they stoned him to death and his only thing that was wrong, and it really wasn't wrong, but they stoned him for preaching Christ. Stephen was a fanatical Christian, and he preached the word of God. But the fanatics of Satan, they carried him out of the sea. They stopped up their ears, and they picked up their stones, and they stoned this man Stephen to death. They were fanatics. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, whose name was Saul, chapter 8. I think Saul is a fanatic, don't you? He's a fanatic of the destruction of people. We got some fanatics in our nation today that are bent on the destruction of of people and things and property. Fanatical. Fanatical. You see, Christianity has spread to Damascus 170 miles away, and so Saul says, I need papers, I need authority so I can go there and drag those Christians back. What was he trying to do? He was trying to stop the spread of Christianity. You're not going to stop the spread of Christianity. There is always a remnant. There's always a voice. There's always people that preach the truth. God always sees people saved all over the world. Even in great times of persecution, the word of God still goes forth. But how foolish it is. And through history, the fanatics that we've had in history who have tried to stamp out the church, the cause of Christ, Christianity, they've tried and tried and tried, and Christianity is still alive today. Glory to God. You can't close this thing down. What a great truth that is. So the second thing I see here in Acts chapter 9 in verse number 3 is not only, first of all, Saul was ruthless as well as fanatical in what he believed. It's okay today, Christians, to be fanatical in what you believe if it's, if it's concerning Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with that. And then in verse number 3, the Bible says, it talks about the shining light. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. See, Saul had been running from God and the truth of the gospel. He refused to believe it. Now he would run smack dab into Jesus himself. Now, I don't know if you like westerns. My dad used to love to watch westerns. Old Westerns. The classic Old Western film called High Noon was about a town marshal who, despite the disagreements of his newly wed bride and the townspeople that were around him, must face a gang of deadly killers all alone at high noon when the gang leader, an outlaw he sent up to prison several years ago, would arrive into town on the noon train, thus called high noon. We find a high noon event here in this chapter, church. Acts chapter 22 and verse number 6. Let's turn over there and let's read it. We have a high noon event here in the life of a man by the name of Saul. In Acts chapter 22 and verse number 6, it simply says this. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. Turn over to chapter 26 of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a great book of the Bible. It has great, great truths in it. Acts chapter 26 and verse number 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. This is the apostle Paul now giving his testimony to the king. And he's giving his testimony that it was about noonday. It was high noon when this 
light came down and shone upon him. And it was, it was so bright, the Bible says, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And he begins to give his testimony and his witness of what happened the day he got saved. How many remember the day he got saved? Now, it's Sunday morning, and I'm excited to be in church because it's the Lord's Day, and it's a time to preach the Bible, and it's a time to get excited about the things of God and be thankful that God truly is good in what He's done in all of our lives. So keep your head up as we think about these things and we think about this teaching in the book of Acts. The Bible's exciting. Church is exciting. Being in love with God is exciting. You see, high noon was the time of confrontation. And you had a high noon, if you're saved. And you had a high noon, if you're saved. That was that moment in time where you were confronted with the fact that you are a sinner. That Christ died for your sins. That Christ was buried according to the scriptures, and he rose again. And you must repent of your sins and ask Jesus Christ into your life to be your personal Lord and Savior and to forgive you of your sins. And when you did that or said something along those lines, realize you were a sinner, he died for you, was buried, rose again, you repented of your sins, what happened? The Holy Spirit came in and you were saved. Remember that high noon experience? Maybe it was in nighttime, maybe it was in morning time, maybe it was in the afternoon, but that was a high noon time. It was a point that you were confronted with your sin and the real reality that you had a Savior who loved you enough that he died upon the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again, and, and we know all those things. And you came to that realization that you were lost and you received Christ into your life. Now, I've dealt with others. And I present the gospel of salvation to them. And they got to the point of high noon. And they refused to accept it. Do you believe you're a sinner? Oh, yes. Do you believe that Christ died on the cross? Oh, yes. Do you believe he was? Oh, yes. Do you believe you repented of your sins? He come to your life and be your personal Lord? Say, yes. Would you be willing to? No, I don't really want to do that. And I talk to people, and I talk to people, I've led people to Christ, and there's some I've not been able to lead to Christ. And I don't take it as an offense to me. I've done what I've been able to do, and I've presented the gospel without fear. We talked about that and used that method. It's a great method to talk to people about the Lord. And if they get saved, great. If they don't get saved, that's not my fault. Because the Holy Spirit must convict them of their sin. And they can be convicted of all those things, but they're not willing to take that step for whatever reason. And receive Christ as their Savior. So you see, if you got saved, your high noon experience was when you were confronted with the truth. When you witness to someone, and I witnessed someone this past week and got to that high noon experience and was not able to lead them to Christ at this point. But it was a high noon. Yes, 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 yes. I just don't know that I can do that right now. The Bible says that it happened suddenly, out of nowhere. He's on his way, and boom! The light's brighter than the light of the sun. You ever tried to look at the sun? You know those eclipses where you're supposed to wear glasses, but sometimes people try, and it can do damage because the thing comes in front of the sun, it looks dark, but it's still the rays are coming. You can't, you can't look into the sun just naturally. It's too brilliant, too bright. Brighter than the sun. Because it's the son of God, see? <laughs> Great truth. But the Bible says it happens suddenly. And I want to give you this principle here today, church. Events in your life and my life can change suddenly. In an instant, the phone rings, your life's forever changed. A knock at the door, your life's forever changed. The doctor's office, oh, doctor, not that. Your life's forever changed. In a moment, in an instant in our life, 
Who thought what would happen in 2020? Who have you ever knew of that, heard of that? But in an instant, millions of lives were changed. I don't know how many people, but I'm sure people committed suicide and ended their lives because in the frustration of all that and all this going on, they just ended their lives. And in a moment, church, in an instant, your life and my life can change forever. When I got saved, my life changed. When you got saved, your life changed in an instant forever, didn't it? Your circumstances, your plans, your health, your finances, family relationships, can all change very, very quickly. Proverbs 27, 1 says it this way, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. For this reason it is crucial and vital and essential that you put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. If you have never done that, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. You see, you never know when death will come on you. Think back with me on September 11th of 2001. 2,977 people went to work that day, not really realizing that the action of 19 hijackers would end their lives. And the horror it must have been, and I've been on top of the World Trade Centers, and I stood up there with the antennas. You used to be able to, it was a marvelous sight. But can you imagine the fear and the anxiety of those people in that building when those planes crashed and they were above the flames with no way out. People jumped from a hundred stories. And you would hear the news reporter there, boom, boom, boom. Behind them, the bodies hitting the pavement. Uh, at, at what kind of a speed, I don't know, but they just literally jumped because there was no hope of survival. And they went to work that day and didn't think anything about their life ending. And in a moment, they were in eternity. You better think about that. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then you need to receive him even today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2 is a great verse of scripture. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 2. The Bible says this, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Now that's an interesting word. Don't read through the Bible and say, well, see, I don't know what, study and try to find out what the words mean. The words of Scripture are very powerful. And I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And what God is saying, he says, I have succored thee. It simply means to relieve or to help. When in distress run to him for support. Aren't you glad that the Lord can succor you and help you and relieve you in your time of distress and trials and difficulty because he's already succored you and he's saying today is the day of salvation. That's a powerful thought today, church. It's a powerful thought that we have an almighty God. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. We have a God who's still in control. And he can help us in the times of great difficulty. And it doesn't mean that we may not go through times of difficulty. But we have someone that's there 
that we can call upon to help us, to relieve us, or help us within distress, and run to for support. Man, if you're saved, you've got the greatest support system in all the world. Yes, Holy Spirit of God, other Christian friends, the church, you've got a great support system to help you in difficult times. Isn't that good? Isn't that wonderful? And the third thing I see here in Acts chapter 9, in verses 4 and 5. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I wonder, I wonder what that voice sounded like. His voice is compared to the rushing of many water. I mean, it's a lot of... So I don't know what it sounded like. We're not really told, but I wonder what God's voice sounded like. And he said, who art thou? Then there's a comma. And then he says, Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And the pricks is like an, an instrument that they used to go oxen and stick them and prod them on. That's what a prick was. It's like a long pointed stick. Hard for you to kick against the pricks. So the third thing I see in this message, and this is very important in the message, is that Saul of Tarsus made some wonderful discoveries that day. He made some wonderful discoveries that day on the, on the road to Damascus. And he discovered that Jesus was actually alive. Aren't you, a glad, aren't you glad we serve a living, risen Savior? You ask me how I know? I know because he lives within my heart, the song says. Doesn't have to be Easter to say, we serve a living, risen Savior. Amen. And he's still at work in the world today, folks. Yes. God's not caught off guard by anything. But see, he discovered that day that Jesus was actually alive. And believers had been constantly affirming that truth. So it wasn't like a new revelation. Turn it over to Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts is a great book. In Acts chapter 2, this had been talked about for a long time. I'm sure he, he must have heard, maybe even Stephen, when he was, he might have been preaching and witnessing. Maybe he heard something at that point. We don't know. But he stood there, and, and the clothes and the garments were laid at his feet as they stoned the very life out of Stephen for his preaching of the gospel. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, Whereof we are all witnesses. Now, this is the preaching of Peter. And Peter's saying this thing wasn't done in the closet. And there are many witnesses to the fact that the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical reality. And we're going to give you an illustration in just a moment to confirm that. Turn to chapter 3 and verse 15. So, this wasn't something that perhaps Saul had never heard. I would think he probably would have heard some of it. Because I think Stephen would have probably said something like that even when he's being stoned to death. Maybe when he's persecuting Christians along the way and killing them, maybe some of them are giving testimony. The scriptures don't tell us, but I, I believe that probably a gospel message was probably given out to Saul to some extent. Maybe it wasn't long. They may not have time long to live before they were killed, but I'm sure there might have been some type of a witness. Chapter 3 and verse 15. And Peter is preaching again. And he said, And killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now go to chapter 5 and verse number 30. Chapter 5 and verse number 30, the book of Acts. The God, look at verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus... Whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. He discovered that day that this Jesus that he was persecuting, he was alive. 
Man, aren't you glad he's still alive? <laughs> he's still alive. He's seated on the right hand of the throne of God. He's still alive. We have access to him through prayer. Not only did he discover that Jesus was actually alive that day, he discovered that he was a lost sinner. <laughs> he discovered he was a lost sinner in need of a Savior. In Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? <laughs> and then he discovered that God can transform any person's life. Now, you don't get that here in 9, but you get that over in Timothy about Paul. So let's go to the book of 1 Timothy and chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse uh, number, chapter 1 and verse 12, I think it is. And we read this a little bit earlier. And I thank Jesus, Christ Jesus our Lord who who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer, blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And then he goes on to say, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You know, if you're saved today, you weren't saved in any way by your own merits or your own strength. You're saved by the grace of God. And you're saved by the mercy of God. And maybe you was a bully before you got saved. Maybe you're a violent aggressor. I never will forget many, many years ago reading about a story of a, a gang member who had got saved and his life was changed and he had a ministry to reach other gang members and God used him in a great way because he was a bully. He was a violent aggressor, but God saved him. Sometimes we, we might get the, th the feeling that we were pretty good. But all our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah. And that filthy rags in that portion of Scripture means leprous, poisonous, infested rags that lepers would tent, used to wrap around their bodies to keep the pus and the infection seething out of their very flesh into those rags. And that's what the very best we can offer to God kind of takes away this thing. Well, I can get, I can get to heaven by one Oh, no, you can't get there. But so many people think it's a scale. If I had good and bad and got with it, I'll make it. No, all the very best you have and I have is those, rich, uh, those, those uh, rags that are poisonous and infected with infection. That's all we can offer to God. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. Can you get excited about that? Yeah, yeah. Huh. So when you see somebody that's a bully, see somebody that's really aggressive, you say, oh, God could never save them. Go back to Acts 9 and say, yeah, but he saved Saul. And even if we weren't that way, it still took the grace of God to save us because all our righteousness are filthy rags. But sometimes I think we tend to think, well, we're pretty good. Sometimes I look at my life and I said, I'm pretty bad. Hmm. How about you? <laughs> yeah, we can dress up and clean up. And, but God knows the heart. First Timothy verses 1, 14 to 16, 16 talks about mercy and grace and Grace removes the guilt of sin. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. To not remember him as far as the east is from the west. Yeah. Bears in the depths of the deep sea. God forgive, forgives and they're gone. Grace removes the guilt of your past. Isn't that wonderful? Mercy. Mercy takes away the misery that's caused by your sin. Have you ever blown it? And got in the flesh. And your sin spewed out a bunch of misery on a bunch of people. Thankful for God's grace. 
that removes my guilt and mercy that takes away the misery that is caused by our sin. You see, Paul received undeserved relief of misery. You ever think in his life he thought back to the people he killed? You ever think back about all the heartache he tore up with families when he killed mom and a dad and the kids had nobody? You think that ever came back to his mind? I'm sure in the flesh, Satan probably tried to beat him to death with that. But he, reser- he received that mercy that God gave him relief from all that he had done. Huh. You see, mercy accompanies saving grace. It's a powerful day, folks. Powerful truths. And then a fourth thing here. The Saul of Tarsus was now a man with a teachable spirit. I don't believe you probably could taught Saul much of anything, especially about Christ, up until this point. He had closed that off. It was not coming in. He had the papers breathing out slaughters and threatenings. Probably everything else out of his mouth. But in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, there is a confrontation, the noonday confrontation. And he trembling. You know what that means? He was under conviction. He was under conviction of his sin. You think anybody had to say to Paul or Saul, hey, you're, you believe you're a sinner? <laughs> I think he probably knew he's a sinner. And I've never had anybody I've witnessed to that has, has ever told me I am not a sinner. I've never had one person. I've had people not receive Christ and get saved, but not one person has ever said, Pastor, I'm not a sinner. Because you can refute that very easily. If they're married, talk to their wife or talk to their husband. Hello? Some of you men and women are very silent here today. It's easy to refute. If you're not married, you can... You ever thought a bad thing? I mean, you could, it's very easy to refute that. But when, they, when he was confronted with the truth, it brought conviction. He trembled. And it brought conversion or salvation. Go back to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we'll all do fate as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind hath taken us away. James Walker made this comment, and he said this about Saul. And he said of Saul that instead of being a proud Pharisee riding through the streets with the pomp of an inquisitor, he was now a stricken man trembling and groping and clinging to the hand of someone to guide him because he could not see (laughs) to get to where God told him to go. What a change of events, folks. From a powerful man to a man that had to have someone just to lead him how humiliating do you think that must have been and yet so many people today say I don't need God I don't need anything I'm a self made no you're not a lot of people have invested in your life to get you to where you're at you didn't get there by yourself good or bad and the arrogance of people and the arrogance of I don't need God and I don't need you and I don't need the Lord and I didn't need him in my life and I don't need him in my death and all the things I've heard over the years of the arrogancy of man until God says I need to get you to where you're groping in the darkness. Mm. Let me ask you right here this morning in the message. Are you teachable? <laughs> or you know it all? You've been saved a long time. You've heard it all before. You know all the message. You know everything to say. No, are you teachable? 
Because if you're teachable, I can help you. And if you're teachable, God can help you. But if you're not teachable, I can't help you and God can't help you. And then, are you tender towards the things of the Lord? And then in Acts chapter 9, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says this. It talks about the sightless Saul. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three day, and he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat, nor did he drink. See, Saul was blinded, but he saw what he needed to see. His physical eyes were blinded, but his spiritual eyes had been opened. He was led by the hand into Damascus for three days and had no sight. See, God was humbling Saul and preparing him for ministry. Sometimes as a Christian, sometimes as a preacher, we can get so arrogant, can't we? We can become so self-sufficient that we don't need anything. And all God has to do is touch us because we're groping. I like what James Montgomery Boyce said. He stated that in the 18th century, there were two young lawyers in England whose names were Lord Littleton and Gilbert West. These men did not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. As a matter of fact, they were adamant in their unbelief and rejection and skepticism of Christianity and felt their reasons were very valid. One day in a conversation between the two, one said Christianity stands upon a very unstable foundation. There are only two things that actually support it. The alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ and the alleged conversion of Saul of Tarsus. If we can disprove those two stories, which should be rather easy to do, Christianity will collapse like a house of cards. Gilbert said, all right then, I'll write a book on the alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ and I will disprove it and Littleton said if you write a book on the resurrection I'll write a book on the alleged appearance of Jesus to the Apostle Paul you show why Jesus could not possibly have been raised from the dead and I'll show that Saul could not have been converted as the Bible says he was by a voice from heaven on the road to Damascus so they went off and went their own separate ways and they went to write their own books and Later, they met again, and one of them said to the other, uh, I'm afraid I have a confession to make. I've been looking into the evidence for this story, and I've begun to think that maybe there is something to this after all. The other said, the same thing's happened to me, but let's keep investigating and see if these stories and see where they, we come out. In the end, after they had done their investigations and had written their books, each one had come to an opposite conclusion of what they originally believed in the beginning of their investigation. They believed what the Bible had said, and Gilbert West wrote a book called The Resurrection of Jesus Christ, arguing that it is a fact of history. And Lord Littleton wrote a book called The Conversion of St. Paul, You see, they once were blind, but now they were able to see the conversion of a man by the name of Saul. Aren't you glad you're saved? You don't have to fear witnessing and being ashamed to open your mouth about what people will say because we have the truth said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto me except through the Father. So church today, get your heads up. Don't walk around all discouraged. Be informed, but don't be overly informed in all the media. 
and be informed with the greatest book that you'll ever read that tells about men and women just like you and me that came to Christ or rejected Christ but how they had a high noon experience and were confronted with the truth of the gospel this is what's going to change America nothing else if my people God's people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray if the time in which we're living doesn't cause you to pray more I don't I don't know how to help you <laughs> you see through the prayers of God's people he can change any nation and he can certainly change America but if God's people are just caught up in all the events on TV, get on your knees, folks. Call out to God and say, God, give us grace Amen. with mercy. We have sinned. We have gotten away from you. But, oh, God, how we need you. My Bible says if God's people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways do you believe that today Amen. and all God's people said Amen. Heavenly Father thank you for this wonderful account of the conversion of a man by the name of Saul and God thank you for the day I got saved thank you for how you changed my life so grateful for your goodness in my life and Father, we still have the greatest message that's ever been upon the face of this earth, and that's that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And we need to take that message into the world in which we're living, living in, especially in a time like now when people are so afraid about so many things that we can give them hope. So God, may we look to the Bible, may we look to the scriptures and and look to the scriptures and come to church and, and be here to hear from your word to bring a source of encouragement and help and strength to us that we need in the days in which we're living. And we've always needed you, God, and we've always needed to pray, and we've always needed to be in church, we've always needed to, to, to spend time in your word, but God, even much more as we see the day approaching, be serious and busy about the master's business. God, help us to share the gospel with others, not just testify about it and, and talk about it and say amen, but actually talk to people about these great things and give people an opportunity to respond to the grace and mercy of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to me. You have been so good to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Are we going to sing? I